Okay, so Ward has been an LDS Family History Center volunteer librarian for over 30 years. He is a member of APG, which is the Association for Professional Genealogists, performing research for clients for over 20 years. He's a graduate, graduate of um, SUNY at Buffalo and NCCC. He specializes in Western New York as well as Welsh and English genealogical research and is experienced with kinship report preparation for cases in Erie and Niagara County, New York surrogates court. Ward has helped to reunite many families who were separated due to adoption using research and DNA. He has presented various topics to organizations including church records, land records, adoption, and forensic genealogy, including expert witness efforts for circuit court cases. This is so impressive to me. So impressive. So please welcome Lord Bray. Thank you. Just so you see how these work and to support what they just said, I mean, we've been talking about doing an adoption presentation program, what I call a primer, you know, for a while. And uh, it's a really, it's a wide and broad topic, right? Um, so what I thought I would do is start with a beginner's program. And, and I thought maybe in the future there's enough interest that we could get a workshop going. Now, if you wonder if I'm going to throw you all this information at you and then run away, I'm, I'm available for free consult anytime. I'm a family history librarian first, and I love to help people take it to the next step, all right? So uh, I give my time at the library, the time there is free. There's 40 librarians there. If I can't help you, one of them can. Okay, how many people have been to the Family History Center? There's some familiar faces here, so um, glad to see you back. Um, I guess I'll apologize in advance. This isn't a PowerPoint presentation with a bunch of bullets on it. I've written this so that you can take it with you and use it as a tool. There's at least a hundred links in here to useful information, to tools, and to resources to help you find uh, the birth parents that you're looking for. Now, I debated whether to ask this question, but I'd like to know my audience. Is there anyone here who is brave enough to say that they're uh, adopted and is, are looking for their birth parents? Okay. Um, so, the rest of us probably have adoptees in our trees. I've, <laughs> yeah. I've certainly got several. I've, are there any folks that have been doing genealogy here for a while? How many people in your database? In the database. How many people in your database? I don't even know. I hate to say it. <laughs> 13,000. 13,000. So there's bound to be quite a few adoptees in there. So um, this, this will work for you. The reason I ask is this will work for you. Um, even if you're not the adoptee that's looking for birth parents. All right? So this, the perspective is important. I, I wrote this with the adoptee in mind, but it will help you find any adoptive person. So a lot of information in here. I don't have it all memorized. I'm going to go through it with you. I'm going to make sure that what I have in here is understood. Um, if there's anybody here that likes to follow along PowerPoint slide by PowerPoint slide. Yeah. Thank you. That's just a summary. I brought a handful of digital copies for anybody who would like to have. I, what it is, it's, it's PowerPoint, then there's a, um, an Adobe PDF version if you don't have PowerPoint. There's a PowerPoint slideshow in here, which is, it's just, the slideshow software is free, even though Microsoft PowerPoint is not free. Mm -hmm. And if you, down, if you download the, the PowerPoint viewer, does anybody use this? The PowerPoint viewer is, version is also available, and you just page up, page down, and, and you'll see the same presentation. Um, there's also a, a terrific publication in the digital copy. Uh, let's see. I know I have a copy of it here somewhere. Well, I anyway, mean, it's an excellent abbreviated version of what I'm telling you here, and it's, 
it's, it's done by professionals who help people every day find the adoptees' uh, parents. For anyone who just wants to understand the, the basics of what I'm going to talk about today, there's two sections to this presentation, to this primary. When I was putting this together, I asked myself some questions. Because uh, it's a real sensitive topic. I've, I've, I've worked with clients who uh, struggle with this. This is a very sensitive topic for both the adoptee and the, the parents who gave them up, the biological parents. And so I, I, could, I started the presentation, I hope I don't lose you in this, but in, in a list of what I call considerations. Okay. We're going to review these considerations when you're looking for birth parents. And then we're going to talk about where the heck you look for information about birth parents. Okay? So front page considerations. I think you'll find this useful when you, when you start on your journey. <clears throat> okay? And then on the back is, is how, how to find birth parents. And I've been successful for clients in every one of these categories, and so we can talk about those in as much detail as you like. Am I speaking loudly enough? Mm -hmm. Louder would be better. Okay. I'm going to holler at the people in the front end. Or you could move up. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I found when I used to teach night school <laughs> to adults? Uh, the people in the front row always got the best grades. So. <laughs> Not because I like them, but because they can hear me talk. My, um, my voice isn't what it normally is today, so I'll do my best. All right, let's run through this. As a professional, okay, just to give you a perspective of why the heck you should listen to me uh -huh. talk about adoption, I connected brothers through traditional genealogy. Okay, this was over 20 years ago. And the paper trail that we all chase for genealogy, you can be successful in finding birth parents. Uh, long story, but. Okay. I have identified, uh, taken to raise just by studying census over a 20-year period. to find that, you know, there's a couple over here with three children, and all of a sudden those three names are, are with other people with the same surname. You realize that these were children of a couple that passed away, and their family took them to raise. And, and once, you, once you have that aha, you, you, can, you can go back and check the court records where they lived, and and back it up, right? So there's um, taken to raise is an interesting um, type of adoption that we'll talk about. <clears throat> I found it through surrogate court records. Surrogate court has two primary sort, uh, uh, purposes. Who can tell me what that is? Um. It's to make sure that the stuff that the deceased had ends up in the right hands, right? Normally, you all should have a will. And the will, the will of the dead says, this is where my stuff goes. Give it to my spouse, give it to my grandchildren, give it to the dog pound, right? And surrogate court in 400 years of common law says, okay, we'll make sure that even after you're gone, somebody's going to listen and honor your will. Except in New York. New York says, no, sorry, we don't, we don't use wills. We, we know better than that. <laughs> the first, yeah. if, if, you're, if you're the first of a pair of spouses, to pass, New York State says your will is useless. It, it doesn't count. Everything goes to the surviving spouse. So, anyway, I love New York State. You can tell, right? <laughs> so, the other purpose of surrogate court is to deal with underage people. And I'll say it that way because it's a very loose, uh, very broad term. Uh, adoption and the care of minors. Okay, so. A lot of times you hear about surrogate court and you think, well, that's wills and dead people and probate, um, but it, it also has to do with minors, okay, and my NOR. All right, so th those records are very useful. They're all public record going back several hundred years in, in Erie County. So uh, go into the records room someday and surf. They've got half of it digitized now. You don't have to wait to see the records. It's just a... It's a wonderful adventure. If any of your family's been here for any amount of time, uh, it's, it's an extraordinary journey. You'll learn things you don't want to know. Mm -hmm. Right, Sally? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I found, all right, so we'll get through that. I found siblings through DNA matching. And I think we've all heard these stories now. There's some really cool 
TV shows. Is there anybody watch these TV shows now? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., who's uh, mm -hmm. who's got uh, C. What's her name? C. 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 Moore. Yeah, Moore. Thank you. And uh, she's just extraordinary in what she knows. And uh, 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 long lost family. Um, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Where are your roots? They're uh, you know, they're they're all because of. Uh, this wonderful new tool that we have. It's the first time in history, by the way, of genealogy that you can know your great-grandparents but not know your grandparents. It's, it's a different world, right? I, I actually have that in my tree, in my shortest branch of my tree. I, I know the great-great-grandparents because of DNA. It's a long story, I know. But I don't know which of their children is my great-grandparents. So... You can have a tree with a hole in it. It's really fascinating. So it's a whole new world for genealogists, and it's a, it's a great tool, one of the tools for adoptees, but it shouldn't be the only one. We're going to talk about that. Um, there's different kinds of DNA that we're going to talk about, but certainly through Y DNA, uh, most people do autosomal DNA through with Ancestry or 23 and Me, right? Anybody done Y DNA yet? It's very expensive. Done it for. I, I did it and found that that my surname doesn't go all the way back. You know, you would think your father, and your grandfather, and your great grandfather, and just all the way back is Bray, right? No, no. seven generations back, uh, there was uh, an unwed mother with Bray, and the, the paternal line. Uh, it was very interesting, and so why DNA can be useful. We're going to talk more about. That. Um, so these are examples of why I thought I could write this presentation, and I, I hope you appreciate that each of them was a struggle and quite a journey. Now, the last one, in 2017, I'd identified an 82-year-old man who never knew who his father was uh, and uh, helped him through autosomal DNA to discover a sibling, which was me. So, wow. um, oh, yeah. So, um, and, you know, although I can't relate to adoption and what that feels like, I always knew that this brother was out there and had long given up ever finding out who he was. And he just showed up one day in the DNA. And I introduced him. I did a Henry Louis Gates Jr. with him. I put a, a, a Look up scrapbook right. together. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Turn the page. That's your father. Turn the page. Those are your five brothers and sisters. Turn your page. Those are your grandparents. Turn the page. That's that's your great grandfather in the Civil War. Spent two days with him doing that, and he was just trembling. So it, it can be a nice journey, and it can be a nice a nice end to the journey. So keep the faith. I I uh, my father was a was an interesting fellow and had children with. Several women, and, and uh, I finally found them all. I'm, I'm almost at the end of my journey, but I finally found all my siblings, I think. Although I just found them. There's a woman that shows up as immediate family in my DNA. So the journey continues. <laughs> Alright, so like I said, it's a broad subject. I've written this so that it's a resource. You, you can take it. I hope, I hope you can navigate a computer enough to use the CD version, I can email it to you. Um, the paper version is less helpful because the links don't work. I build links into these things. And people, people come into the library for years with my other presentations on church records or property records and they find that they keep them and carry them around with them because the links are, are so bad that it takes you to so many different places. And every year I have to go through them and check that the links still work because the internet changes. So, um, adoptees and people that are looking for birth parents for anyone, not just the adoptee themselves. There, there's a lot of considerations, and we're going to talk about those first, and then we're going to talk about the resources, and the tools, and the approaches to finding the birth parents. All right, so take a moment to consider why an adoption may have occurred. Clues that you'll get by, by answering this question are many, right? Why did the adoption occur? Well, you know, the, the parents died. Right? So maybe the family stepped in and 
and it was taken to rights. Maybe it was an underage girl who was pregnant, and her parents didn't approve. You know, in the old days, there was a shameful thing. You were sent to a, at least to call them, a girl's home. Home, home for, for wayward women. Mother, yeah. For wayward or unwed mothers. Way, yeah. Wayward yeah. girls. Wayward women. And um, it's unfortunate. You know, I, I put myself in those shoes and, and as a grandparent. I, I can't imagine telling somebody to give my grandchild away. Wouldn't you? So um, lots of reasons, and you can read through the list. Uh, my favorite is the residents of the institutions. Now, we're going to talk about this in the second half of this presentation. Mm -hmm. But the institutions, like the, the, what they call them, the foundling hospitals, the home for children, the juvenile asylums, Children's aid institutions, and, and it seems like every religious sect had their own organization and structure and process for, for helping these, these children. So it, why is it that there were so many children that needed to be adopted? Have you given that any thought? There was a lot of death, right? I mean, uh, you had, how many people have big families in their tree? Like, 12 or 14 children. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you expected to lose half of them. It's a terrible thing. I can't even imagine one nowadays. But, um, so, there were a lot of kids running around. And there's different reasons today, right? We've got uh, you know, sexual uh, rape out there. We've got the um, abandonment. We've got foster care that, that puts children into a system and then eventually hopes to find a good home for them. So, the why really need to consider the why before you're going to look and see where you're going to look for the, the birth parent data. How was it conducted? There's open adoptions where everybody knows everybody. You know the parties that are involved, right? Uh, very rare in, in the Northeast, but in the Midwest and out west, you'll find that some states uh, have always had open adoptions. It depends on the locality you want to talk about that. So, Open adoption, the, the, the birth parents know the adopted parents who know the child, and uh, they can even stay in touch, okay? Closed adoption, normally handled by uh, an institution, right? Father Baker's, what was Father Baker's institution is called, what, OLV? Was the OLV, uh, Our Lady of Victory? Yeah, but Sally, the adoption agency in Buffalo. Drawn a blank. Catholic anyway, charities? Yeah. Catholic charities probably was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they would hmm. arrange for the adoption, and the birth parents would not know the adopted parents. Uh, the informal taken to raise was more common in the past. Now, if, you're, if, you, if you take your brother's child to raise for whatever reason, it, it still has to go through a formal process. In the past, children were. were taken care of in close family units, and they were often considered labor or, or you know, but they were, they were precious family members that were cared for, you know. Mm -hmm. You watch the old movies, you know, we're family, you know, we're going to take care of our kids. Well, that's right. And sometimes people couldn't have children, and so you know, siblings would, would lend their children to their brother or their sister. And so taken to raise was more common in the past, and now even if, it, if you are taken to raise by family, still has to go through the formal adoption process. You can't have a child in your house anymore without legal recourse, right? So, um, but we'll talk about all of this. What is their motivation to adopt? This is one of the considerations where, was it a blacksmith just looking for extra help around the shop? Was it a childless couple who was looking to adopt and maybe went to an agency? Was it family taking on a child because a sibling had died? Did the motivation for adoption is very important to decide in your search, which we're going to talk about, where to go look. Okay, so consider, you know, do you know the motivation to adopt? It's um, an interesting question. Where did the adoption occur? Very important because some, uh, it, seems to, it seems to be based at the state level in the United States. I, I can't speak to Canada, to be honest with you, but 
the United States, the state laws apply. And New York State is one of the worst. You see my little uh, vignette in here. It says, uh, if you can't read that, these two cases symbolize, uh, symbolize how New York has produced and enforced a law so punitive to adoptees that it has moved beyond legitimacy and has entered the realm of farce. It is very hard for adoptees to find their birth parents in New York State. And of course, this is a very famous quote from a case that uh, started, started on the journey to, to open those, those doors, but they're still not open. Adoption records are not only sealed, but sealed forever. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a sad thing. So, um, other states, we'll talk about that. Um, the laws change constantly over time. So, another consideration is the laws at the time that the adoption occurred. A lot of the laws are changing. New York, New Jersey is opening their doors. They were very similar to New York in the past. They've actually come up with new legislation that says, we're going to put systems together, and as long as both sides want to talk, we're going to put them together. So, very encouraging. Um, uh, privacy laws have made it more difficult. Yeah, privacy laws are, I mean, we're, we're all talking about privacy and our right to privacy in America. Actually, we don't have the right to privacy in America. It's not in the Constitution, it's not in the Bill of Rights. But we're always talking about privacy, and laws have been enacted. Uh, there's a time frame that you have to wait to get a birth, marriage, and death. Does anybody know what that is? In New York State? Well, the births are 75 years. And 70, yeah. And the death is 50. Right. And you have to prove that they're deceased, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird because there's usually <laughs> ordering the record to find out when they died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and marriage is also 50 years, but you have to prove they're deceased. Um, that's an example of a privacy law that makes it even diff more difficult now for us to, to find birth parents than it was in the past. It's better than Pennsylvania's 105 years for those yes. births. <laughs> yeah, my, my father was 45 when I was born, died a couple years later. I got his birth record four years ago, yeah, and I'm an old man, so Pennsylvania's a bit punitive as well. Um, they're a commonwealth of the United States, right? Yeah. So, long story there, but look up the difference between the state and the commonwealth. Make it hard. Um, global situations. Um, often laws were enacted or processes were put in place after certain events, like World War I and World War II. There were special provisions for children that were that had to be given up because uh, the gentleman died in the war. Right? The woman had no way to support. Or she, you know, so mm, children in need of a good family was, was in more demand during after the wars. Um, New York City found itself in a crisis. The number of children that were running the street we came up with a, with a, a very interesting Sorry, does anybody know what that is? It's the, the orphan trains. The orphan trains, yeah. You just throw them all the trains and they go, go out west. Some nice farmer in Ohio will, will take you for as a farm worker. But I guess it was, it was practical, right? Sounds, I don't think they do something like that today. Just ship them out west. But um, um, now there are, there are efforts to get into those records and to help people find uh, their birth parents through the the train records, and they're very few and far between. All right, so another consideration. Uh, consider the birth parents themselves. Now, sometimes you'll be given some information. Sally, you were given some information, right? Yeah. You don't mind me picking on you, do you? No, I can pick on you. <laughs> um, you're giving, given non-identifying information. Um, rarely are you given names of dates or addresses, but the non-identifying information is interesting. This one that I put in here, you might not be able to read this now, but it's, it's fascinating. It talks about this young woman. She's uh, brown eyes, brown hair, very attractive face. Uh, she's in good health. She's a widow. And you read down, you're going, oh, gee, what, you, know, you, you kind of feel sorry for her. She's widowed and she can't support the, the child, maybe. 
And then you read at the bottom, it says, all of her pregnancies were normal. So, it's, so this is like, wait a minute, it sounds like she's just giving up all of her children for a heartbreak, you know, so, if not for her, for the children. No complications during any of the pregnancies. So, um, it gives occupations, it gives a physical description, it will sometimes tell you medical backgrounds. Before I forget, yeah. Sally's, Sally's been quite generous in sharing with anybody who's interested paperwork involved in, in an adoption. Sally, you want to tell us what's in here so I don't struggle with this? There's the adoption papers themselves. Well, There's first and foremost, when parents went to adopt, they had to find some place to go. Um, my parents chose the Lutherans because that was their religion. And the Lutheran Service Society had a branch much like Catholic services or Catholic charities. And then you, that starts the process. And with that, then if the adoption agency deems that you are, deems the parents, you know, of good moral character and able to support a child, they do... I think, as, it, as you've seen, they, they go pretty much from soup to nuts as investigating the parents. It's kind of like a background check. In yeah, the day. a very detailed background check. And <coughs> mine might not have been as detailed as such because I had an adoptive brother who was older than I was. So at least... So they'd already been through the process. And they'd already been through the process, but that still didn't absolve them of going through the process. Because what was true three years earlier may not be true today. Um, and so then there's all the legal work and there's all the findings of what the agency found out about my parents. Um, in those records, it listed where my parents lived, how much they made, how much money was in the bank, uh, where my father worked, did my mother work. Um, and you were a special case where you actually got them to show you your birth yes, certificate, your I, original I, birth certificate. Yes, I, I don't have my original birth certificate. I never got my original birth certificate out of this, but what, years ago, back in the 70s, before DNA, I pulled a fast one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found a lawyer that was willing to take on the case of helping adoptive children find their biological parents. He, in turn, went, as I don't know if it's the exact term, but he went judge shopping. And to find a judge in the uh, Supreme Court area that was sympathetic to the cause. They must have had a conversation because then I had some tasks I had to do. I had to tell one of my adoptive parents what I was doing. I had to get two letters from physicians and one of them had to be a psychiatrist to prove that I wasn't like a weirdo. Well, we know she got that one. But then, <laughs> and then I had to have a medical reason. And I used my OBGYN at the time. I hadn't had any kids. And so I thought, well, I'll just throw this out there. Maybe one day I will. And he would have no knowledge of my, I mean, I have no medical history to give any doctor. Right. at that point in time and for many years. And after a couple hundred dollars and some hemming and hawing and some up one side and down the other, I actually got a judge to order open my sealed adoption records. Wow. So that's where some of those papers wow. come from because there's the petition to the court, then there is the... Um, Social Service Agency's report, and in that report is stuff about my mother. There are actual surrender papers in there where she actually has to sign her name to surrender all rights to me. And so you have that. Then you have the adoption papers that actually come to the parents, that the parents get from the surrogate court, in which they say that 
so-and-so will now be known as Sally, and enclosed usually was obviously your, quote, new birth certificate, and um, the bill from the lawyer. <laughs> so, you know, I, we're going to talk about what's available and how to go about this. And where but, to that's, go. But, but that's the Sally's one of the lucky ones. She got more paperwork than, than, ever seen. than people can expect to get, but there, it's out there. And if you can get behind the door, this is what you can see. This is what you can find, and, and you're finding answers. So this is up here. Sally's offered to let folks review the, these redacted documents just to get a sense for what, what exists. You may not be able to get your hands on it. You may be able to, but it exists. But I just want to say one thing. Everything that's in there is not true. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well, I think that's good. Is, the is same that, with every document we find, right? Well, yes, because my mother gave a little synopsis of my father, and once I met my mother, I found out that was not true. Oh. Well, Your birth mother? Yeah. yeah. How long ago was this? That was back in 70, okay. like no. I said, the 70s. Like I said, I pulled a fast yeah. one. Yeah. How long did it take to get through all of that? About? I would say it probably took a good nine months to a year yeah. because you just had to get everything together. Yeah. And back to court, back to court. And, and the hardest part was telling my mother. Now, yeah. I want to point out yeah. one, one bullet on this page, you know, cons saying consider the parents. I'm hoping that every adoptee finds the birth parents, but you really have to consider them in this whole process. and, and we're going to talk about considering what your goals are. Yes. I have a friend who, luckily through ancestry, has found both birth mother and birth father very easily. But she didn't start until after her mother died, even though her mother had told her it was okay. She had to wait. Yeah. She just felt it was... There's, there's a lot of that, and I can share other stories like that with you too from my clients and from myself. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. Giving up the child may have been a very difficult thing. Maybe, maybe a woman that had no other choice than to hope that her child had a better life through social services or because she was underage and her parents said, you can't keep it. Um, this could have been a, a sexual assault, a child resulting from a sexual assault, and you're going to bring up all those horrible memories, right? Um, so all I'm saying is, one of the considerations is consider the birth parents as much as you want to know, you want to connect, you, you, you're eager to show up at the door. Um, this is where I first started talking about that. I don't mean to, to lecture. I, I'm just saying these are things I've learned. Um, that it, it's a surprise. Uh, my, my clients, the reason I put this here is I've had several clients who were surprised that their birth parents didn't want to know them. And, 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 Lots of stories that are good, and there's lots of stories like that. So, you know, some, sometimes they're hiding secrets that they don't want anybody to know. So consider the parents. Another consideration is the age of adoption. The only reason I bring this up is if the child was with the parents for a while, you can follow the genealogy trail and use census and other means to find them through normal genealogy, right? You can find the young child with, with the parents. Uh, through normal genealogy. Or, if they were institutionalized for other reasons, there's a lot of institutional records that we're going to talk about. More institutional records than you can shake a stick at just for Western New York. And I'm going to show you some of those. I'm going to share a publication with you, and you can start digging into those that you may or may not be aware of. Another consideration. What are the reasons that you want to find them? And this is the tough one, right? Are you just curious, <coughs> trying to fill out your pedigree chart? Mm -hmm. Are you curious whether you're Irish or German? Right? Or, um, you know, this is for posterity's sake. You want to tell your children who they were from, right? You were from the pioneers that went west, right? And all those nice stories we tell our kids. Then there's the reunion. Do you, do, do, do you, do you hope that you can discover who they are? Reunite. That's, that's, that can be very traumatic. That can be 
surprise him and occur at this point. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Um, siblings was a big thing for me. I was not adopted, but I used some of the same techniques we're going to talk about to, to find three siblings so far, and I think I found a fourth. So um, that can be truly fascinating, and I think a little less sensitive than parent-child. So um, if, you, if you're focused on who's my father, you might want to say, well, did, did he have any other kids? It's just as interesting and just as revealing. Um, do you want, want to understand why? You watch these TV shows, right? I watch them all the time, and these poor souls, they're going, I can't imagine why a woman would, would want to give up her baby. It's like, wow, you know, you know, think about that twice. I think it's not, it has nothing to do with the child's value as a human being. They're not throwing a baby away. They're, they're in a difficult situation, but a lot of people are just haunted by this thought that they were unwanted. It breaks your heart. And we're going to talk about that. That's, that requires healing in a lot of respects. The, the, um, the quote here, number 132 from the site that's called Confessions of Adopt, let's see, Confessions of an Adoptee, is actually a website which has thousands of quotes from adoptees who have been through this journey. This one really hit me. It said, um, reuniting has been more painful than not knowing ever was. And I didn't expect that. Can you imagine, like, you know, not knowing and wondering why you were given up and then to find out by your parents and go, well, that's even worse, right? So um, that website, if you're serious about this, is worth a, a stroll. You'll get an insight into what you're going to encounter and how people thought about it and how they responded to it. And I don't mean to make light of this, but I couldn't ignore the fact that uh, you know, um, Luke Skywalker was uh, the son of, found out that he was the son of Darth Vader, right? And just denied it and couldn't believe it. No, it can't be possible. I'm your father, you know. Um, I'm saying, are you ready for the unexpected emotions? Your identity crisis, right? Here's poor Luke. You know, his father just cut his hand off and he's screaming about, no, this can't be possible. Um, are you ready to be disappointed? Are you ready to be overwhelmed by what you find? I was overwhelmed by what I found with my siblings. Uh, because there were things that were about the father I knew about, but uh, things I'd never known about. So it was fascinating. And are you ready for rejection? You have to be ready for rejection. And are you ready for the peace that comes with the knowledge, that comes with the reunion, that comes with the meeting your siblings for the first time? All right, so, so you're sitting there saying, is he trying to talk me into this, or is he trying to talk me out of it? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to go through these considerations before you, you start your journey. They'll guide you to where you want. Anybody know who Alex Haley is? Mm -hmm. Roots. Roots, right? I love this quote. You know, what if you decide not to do this? I'm challenging on the previous slide of what if you decide to do this? You may be disappointed or you may be shocked. But at the same time, you know, Alex Haley said it best. And all of us is a hunger marrowed deep to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we came from. And uh, boy, after dozens of clients and my own personal experience, I can tell you that that's stronger than you think it is. So here's the summary of the considerations. First side of the page here. I really think it's important for you to write these things down to consider them before you start. And I know you probably already started. Why did the adoption occur? Who were the involved parties? What was the motivation to adopt? Where did it happen? What are the laws in that place? What do you know about the birth parents? Do you, have, do you know the age of adoption? It's very important to guide you. What do you want to accomplish? Are you ready for the emotional roller coaster? What if you decide not to pursue it? Okay, so enough said. Any, any questions about the considerations and why I spent so much time on it? Let's talk about how to get this done. Oh, well, 
throw in a quote here by the, the chefs or cat. You know, Alice says, would you please tell me which way I ought to walk from here, right? Remember this scene? And the cat says, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to go. And she says, I don't much care where I want to go. And he says, then it doesn't matter which way to go. So I'm suggesting that these considerations will be your guide. You will be the answer to the chef's cat on which way you should go. Okay. And I, I have a quote in here, a part of uh, Stephen Covey's work of the seven habits of successful people. Have you read this? It's probably 20, 25 years old now. Uh, in my career, it was the most helpful thing I've ever read. And he has a, one of, one of the seven is to begin with the end in mind. Uh, that will then guide you to your next step every time. All right? And I have some handouts in here. If anybody's curious about the other six habits of successful people. Uh, I've had dinner with Stephen Covey, but he's not paying me to do that. So. <laughs> but it is a fascinating read, and it might get you to read a, a pretty interesting book. All right, so the cat says, get your considerations done, and let's move forward. Here's the approach. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a stack of places to go, people to talk to, work to be done. That may reveal birth parents for an adoptee. And if you're the adoptee, it may reveal. And you may find that you've done every one of these things and you're still waiting. I don't doubt that. There's, there's no magic in here. But I believe that I'm going to share with you some details and maybe some new resources that will help. <clears throat> Traditional genealogy, we can, you know, that's why this organization is here. There's a lot to learn. You can come to a family history center and there are 40 researchers that will give you advice on your next step through traditional genealogy, right? You might get lucky and find that the child wasn't adopted until they were three, and then they were christened in the church around the corner from where the mother used to live, and you actually find church records that tell you the parents. You might get lucky. You know, that, that's an example of traditional genealogy solving this problem. But it doesn't always. And in fact, that there are folks who go to a great deal of trouble to hide the details from you, especially in the, the civil area. Okay, so there are agency records. There's a printout up here that you may want to review. It's available at the downtown library. And it, what it's called is Adoption and Orphanage Resources for Genealogists and Historians. And the digital version of this is available and has hundreds of links. The databases, lists, digitized documents, places to go, people to talk to. Uh, and suggestions on where to search and how. We can't hope to go through all this before, but this, this document will be up here. You can, there's a couple of copies here. You can take it with you. You can review this. That's from the Grosvenor room? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. I've seen this. So, um, I, I haven't noticed it available online until just recently. It's there's really a digital copy now. It is online. If you can't find it, I'd be glad to send it to you. I think it is online. I was helping somebody find, try to find a... And I, I was checking the links yeah. in my other presentations, and uh, I was looking for Grosner Room publications. Yeah. I mean, if you've been there, they're all printed in next to the librarian when you walk in. Um, but the digital versions are available online for some of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so agency records. If you can find agency records, they... They're made public, um, but a lot of them just don't exist. Uh, birth certificate and amended birth certificate. I have had success in sending for a birth certificate from New York State and other states. And you find that although an adoptee's birth certificate is modified in the records, sometimes they were copied before they were modified. And then for two of the clients that I mentioned early on, uh, they actually gave the parents if you know your name or birth. So there's the trick, right? So at times, birth certificates, amended birth certificates can. Well, the other one was a, a redacted and amended birth certificate. And if you used, if you used, 
photographic software correctly. You could actually read what was under the redaction. And we saw some, a name and a half of surname and figured it out. So we cheated. Mm. But uh, get that birth certificate. I have, one, I, I have a client right now who refuses to send to it. She said, that's absurd. I'm going to waste $24. And, and, uh, and so the, that's the primary place where you look for your parents' names is on your birth certificate. Oh, no, we never looked at that. We never sent for that. We've been trying this for 20 years. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I heard you to give you advice. That's wrong. Yeah, what's it worth to you? No, we don't. You know? <laughs> I think it's, what, 22 or 24 bucks? No, it's terrible. It went from 10 to 20, 20. 22, yeah. yeah. I'll chip in if she yeah. can't do it. I felt it. like you it's 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 saying, you know, <laughs> you, you want to wager on that, just give up on things like that. I mean, it's... Um, it's serious, right? Yeah. But... It, you know, you may be surprised to hear me say that. Don't give up on that original birth certificate. Yeah. Buffalo birth records, just to briefly visit this. Buffalo birth records are also available in a sort of... Uh, chronological, order. chronological order. They're by month, I think. I think they're year and month on the film up to a certain date. And then those books mm -hmm. are also at the Historical Society and the archives and the stacks. You go farther back and farther forward. And sometimes if you know your, you know, usually adoptees keep their birthday. So then you just go through and you look and you say, hmm, you know, you might be able to find it. So they're, they're, they're available. Uh, don't give up on this. It's the best source. All right, census records. Census, especially in the old days when you're looking for an adoptee from a while back, is um, do, do your homework. New York State gives a is a census every five years, you know, so you've got, you've got an image of a family and the associated family are surrounding them uh, over a 30, 40 year period in great detail. And taking the raise is very common. Um, and so don't ignore the census record. Census also has the institutions. And this, this publication that I mentioned gives the page numbers for every county in western New York, the page numbers of every institution in every census. So you can find Father Baker's, right, in 1930, um, which you might be able to find anyway, but this has everything in one place. You get it done in an afternoon, okay? So don't forget census. Um, we talked about surrogate court before and the guardianships. The guardianships are recorded in the court records. You just have to know where to look and when. So if you have a, a month where you know the adopt adoption handed, happened in that month, you can kind of scan the index to see if you can't get lucky and find the, the adoptive parents mentioned in a court case. Um, it could be revealed, because it could say adoptive parents, birth parents, if you get lucky. Okay, so, you know, traditional genealogy, the hospital records, they do exist. Um, the name changes are in the basement of the county hall. Erie County Hall is a book down there for name changes and doing business as DBAs. Um, so, um, a taken to raise with an open adoption may be recorded in a name change record. Does that make sense? Uh, state legislative records. And this is the one I always forget. General Assembly accepts adoption petitions from prospective adoptive parents for, um, I'm trying to remember which states. I guess it just said in some states. Anyway, the General Assembly, the state legislature, actually got involved with adoptions. So do your homework on the, the place where the adoption happened and find out if that's where you need to look for those records. Each state is different. Now, Excuse me. When you're appointed as a guardian, I found a record for a family that was researching where the fa father died, mom's still alive, got six young kids. Um, I saw the surrogate record for the appointment of a guardian. Um, I couldn't figure out who th that person was. I had the name, but it didn't seem like a it didn't seem like a related name. What's the responsibility of that guardian t to that family when it's appointed? Is it strictly financial? Do they have to? live with the person? What would that have meant? And this was probably about 1870, 1880, I think. Okay, well let me give you the short answer for guardianship. The responsibility is to the child only. Um, they have to take custody.
custody and responsibility for the minor, what they call the minor, right? And um, I would say in the majority of cases, there's a time frame associated with it. Okay. In other words, they're going to adopt that person that they have the guardianship responsibility for, or they're going to find someone to adopt them. Gotcha. It's, it's, an, interme it's an, right. an intermediate step in the, in the long process. That so that sense? doesn't mean that they actually became the adopted, the adoptive parent of no, the child. No, there's no name change. It's there's just nothing the, that just says gotcha. I'm taking care okay. of. And that's that's what I. My neighbor's <laughs> kid because we were friends. Okay. And then maybe the only person you know. I mean, you come to a new town, you know, maybe all you have, no family. But yeah, could have been a benevolent neighbor. Or no, the neighbors yeah. willing, the nice neighbors next door are willing to take care of this child until it's a permanent home, but it's rarely a permanent assignment. Okay. It's simply a caretaking relationship. Okay. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's that's my experience with those. Um, has anybody ever been to uh, the National Archives or Pittsburgh uh, Library, Salt Lake City? I mean, these some of these places are just just extraordinary. And, uh, the Pittsburgh Library, the Carnegie Library in Pittsburgh, fantastic genealogy site, and uh, if you have Pennsylvania. Roots. Uh, and uh, the, the reading room is that big. Plus, they've got a, oh, at the wow. end is like wow. 200 film and fish readers, too. So, uh, it just humbles you. You're walking through. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, they have every record you can think of. I mean, you're impressed when you look at what the Mormons have in film and fish and digital now and, and uh, what they've gathered over the last 150 years. And then you go here to Pennsylvania and some of the other states, there's a central repository where you, know, you can find all of this. And if not, you know, there's libraries, Mormon Family History Center, City Hall, County Hall, Circuit Court. This is traditional genealogy, and I'm just saying that there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of different places to go. Each county, each state is different. Each city. Anybody from East Aurora? This is Niagara County organization. East Aurora, <laughs> so confusing to me. I get clients down there all the time. And uh, there's East Aurora, and there actually is an Aurora, mm -hmm. which is the town. Yeah. East Aurora is a village. And then there's a town of Aurora, and then there's, a, there's another one. But anyway, there's like four different clerks for one town. I mean, the township is just a square box. And then there's East Aurora and Aurora and, and, and Wales, South Wales, maybe. Anyway, I went to the one one time, the, the town clerk, and I said it says that they were born in East Aurora. He said, Oh, you're, you're talking about the village. We don't have those records. You're talking. I said, Well, where do I go for that? Oh, the next block. There was a whole redundant set of of government. That, same for Tonawanda. You got the town of Tonawanda, the city of Tonawanda. You got Kenmore, you know, Sloan's and Chictawaga, and there's just villages. The, the laws and the, the records, the way they're broken down, get some advice so you're not taking a trip to the wrong place. Um, the, uh, the grocery room has a lot of great documentation on that as well, where to find records. But the Mormons will be more than not happy to help you find those records. All right, social media. Who's familiar with blogs? <laughs> Web logs. You you, talk, you you own a blog, right? I do. Yeah. And what do they what do they do in your blog? Um, I had let it go for a long time, so I just started it this past month. But actually, our county, our society has a blog now too. I've been writing for that. We started that in December, I think. Um, now, so now I can look back and see conversations that people have had about topics. Right? Mm -hmm. So the blog is great because even if you weren't there or you weren't part of the conversation, you might search the Niagara County blog and find that, oh, they've already talked about that cemetery, you know, that sort of thing. Um, wikis, you know, a lot of people call them wikis, but I helped build the first wiki. So the Australian guys are really off the wall, heavy drinkers. <laughs> but anyway, they called it a wiki, so I call it a wiki. Yeah, Wikipedia is a framework where you can, it's a knowledge management framework where you can build your own encyclopedia. And collectively, people build knowledge in 
Well, the Mormons have taken that, and, and they've kind of done a brain dump of everything they know about everything in genealogy. And if you go to the familysearch.org, there's a wiki there which says how to do almost anything. West Virginia, you know, Florida, Germany, Russia, Russia before the Prussian War. Um, fantastic place to, to do the brain dumps and then to go and to benefit from other people's knowledge. So blogs, web blogs, there are a lot that exist for the adoptee. Okay? And wikis, there's a lot to, to, to learn from the wikis because they'll tell you what their journey was all about. Okay, so let's look at a couple examples. Um, the legal genealogist, there's a blog for that. Any question you have about legality, is, somebody's already talked about it on the blog. You'll be able to search and find some good advice in it. The American Adoption News. Uh, Blaine Bettinger, this gentleman, just wrote the book literally about everything to do with, with the adoption search. And he has a blog, he also, you'll see that he also has other resources, but he has a blog out there, um, and he calls it the Shared Centimorgan Project. And it has to do with uh, DNA use in, in adoptions. Have you used this before? Mm -hmm. Or have you read I it? went on a genealogy cruise to see him, and he was in the cabin next to me. Unfortunately, I got super sick and never got to, oh. Oh, <laughs> no. to experience or listen to his lectures, because I wound up being taken out oh dear. Oh. So, I had one of those, but I had one of those, but it was just stupidity. I was supposed to meet Bill Gates, and uh, I was half an hour late. He got it wrong. Oh, jeez. One o'clock? I thought you said one thirty. No, I said one o'clock. Where the hell were you? Uh, I took um, I appreciate it. I took the instead at grip last summer. I did with Blaine Bettinger. And I, after the fact, I said, do people ever take this over again because you're overwhelmed? And he says, oh, yeah, so I'm signed up for this summer, too. <laughs> now, these links, and let me just, whoops. these do go somewhere. Each of these links here will close the only school. So it will take you to the Internet to some resource. This happens to be AmericanAdoptions.com. First certificates and adopted this is a, something to read. How to access your original birth certificate. Okay, and it talks about some, some, some looking at it. Uh, it's the American adoption. Okay, so I think I hit this link, but anyway. Each of these links will take you to a place on the internet. We don't have time to go through all this. It's an hour presentation, but um, <laughs> spend some time in here. Blaine Bettinger is the best. You know, I found that he speaks on every topic. He's an expert, and he's taken the time to make his presentations available. Much like this one, there's a lot of detail in them, so that you can use them as a primer, as a resource to take it to the next step. He has. Um, I'll just go to this one as well, the genetic genealogist. Adding DNA to the genealogist toolbox. Let me know what the son of organs are. They're one of the measurements for, for autosomal DNA. Uh, when, I, when I first saw my brother show up on my list, he said, said uh, 1,479 son of organs and, and 46 segments. And I went, yeah, brother. Mm -hmm. it, you can use these numbers, and so he cleverly calls it the sound of All right, so a couple of really good blogs that you can probably spend the rest of your life surfing. All right, Facebook groups. More social media. We're talking about the social media, the blogs, the, the wikis, and now the social media. Um, adoption beyond the long list of Facebook groups for the world. Uh, you may say, well, I'm adopted in New York. You're going to go to that list, and there's a New York adoptees that will take you to other people who are struggling and learning and, and searching. Okay, So this is probably the most important link I provided. These Facebook groups are, are live, right? You're talking to people. You're interacting. You all have the same desire. C.C. Moore, we talked about her before. 
This is her Facebook page. How many people are on Facebook? Good. You're not on Facebook and you're not a computer person, maybe worth it just for that and then ignore the rest. <laughs> Crazy. So you're saying you're not going to accept our friend request? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you, you post puppies every day. There you go. <laughs> In my dinner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what'd you have for dinner? Yeah. I just so love those. That, that's a moment in my life I'll never get back. Else. <laughs> and then I'm on a diet. So I'm looking at all these, these carb-rich dinners and <laughs> Not as painful as adoption. Mm -hmm. So, uh, adoption support groups, local adoption support groups. We're not talking about one in Washington, D.C. We're talking about getting in a room with people or getting online with folks or having a common interest in Buffalo because it's, Buffalo is unique and you're trying to surf through adoption records or, or original birth records. So, local support groups can tell you everything that's available for, your, for the area. And if you know where, where you were adopted, where the person was adopted, those local groups, you know, you know how that is. Family history centers are the same all over the world, right? But what do you do when you go out of town? You go to the local family history center because they have stuff that nobody else has and they have the expertise that nobody else has. So, all right. So, local adoption support, adopt, adoptive and foster family coalition. Adoption Star, American Adoption Congress, state by state support groups. This uh, this link here shows you the local support groups for each state. Now, I don't know if it makes sense to, because you live here, to go to a New York State local support group if you were adopted in Ohio. So you have to give that some thought. Which one would benefit you the most? Okay, so here, here's the address, phone numbers of people from every state. Wonderful resource. Anybody in, engaged with a local support group right now? The adoption star with the Buffalo, that looks interesting. Yeah. All right. Check the state by state list. This list here, the state by state list and see what's available in Buffalo. Yeah. We'll give you a name and a phone number. I mean, we're not talking the addresses here. We're talking about people who care. People who are listening. People who probably have already been there before. It's the same as me, you know. I, when I was growing up, I didn't even know who my grandparents were. My dad had passed. And uh, so I got with people who were in the know and helped me learn. Once I learned, now I'm helping others. And these adoption support groups tend to be those people that have had success, right. and now they're helping them. So. The support group that I belonged to years ago, of course, doesn't exist anymore, but they are very helpful, right. um, especially when you're talking about other people's experiences and back when you were talking about considerations. They help you look to things that you may not have thought about. These local support groups are fantastic. State records, you know, you, you have to figure out the state records for the state you're in. You, know, you see the people on the news all the time, you may or may not relate, saying everyone has a right to their original birth certificate. This openadoption.org is a, a great resource, a great read. Their perspective on adoption and why they think the record should be open. And you may want to contribute. You know, if you have favorite charities, this might be one of them. And they're fighting for our rights to have our original birth certificate. States with open adoption records, partial access, restricted access, and then, hey, where's New York State? <laughs> the, the highlighted part, the rest are sealed and sealed forever. So, um, people are working to get that changed. You need your voice added to things. Two examples of some state adoption assistance programs. Things are changing. Keep your ear to the rail. New Jersey, I was talking about that before. The new state policy helps New Jersey adoptees. In 2014, they said, we're opening the books. And anybody wants to talk to anybody else, we're going to make it happen. 
that's an expense to the state. Not everybody might have supported that. So it was a very brave move for those politicians. And the Florida Adoption Union Registry, that's always been in place. And they're very aggressive in helping adoptees reunite. That's probably why there's so much crime and murder down the floor. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you know me, you know that I, I either laugh or I cry. You know, it's uh, this this stuff can make you cry a lot. And so I make I make light of it, but I I'm not. Believe me, I'm sympathetic. Growing up without my father is it's a lot like being adopted and not knowing. So adoption registries. If you're looking for your birth parents, you know that is registered. In a registry saying, I was adopted, I was born on the 1st of December 1970, and I blah, blah, blah. Right? There are a lot of them, a lot more than you think there are. Okay? So, um, many are free. Some seek donations, which is fair. There's a cost to, to having this available. Some require a fee, and some are scams. So, do your homework. Here is the best list I could put together. I spent a day putting this list together. This is, this is the most legitimate and the most successful in, in, in results. Okay? To make a long story short, you read up on these. You, I, I subscribe to newspapers.com. So you can go out and you can read about these organizations and, and there's statistics out there. So adoption registry, adopted.com. Find My Family, Adoption and Union Registry, New York State, Adoption Information Registry. Even New York has one, but I don't think it's sponsored by New York. Then there's the firms who promise that they'll find it for you. Right? They'll take your money. And, uh, I, think, I think some are those well-intentioned angels. Some are attorneys looking for work. You just have to know who you're talking to. Um, there is one out there in particular I want to point out. It's called No, Fo no Fine, No Fee. It sounds like the Chinese adoption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It uh, will take you no longer. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's terrible. But, um, that, that, it's legitimate. They do not charge a dime unless they have success for you. What do you have to lose? Yeah. Right? But all of these are, are great resources. Long Lost Family, I've got a couple of TV shows up here. You can write them. Um, they were interested in my story, how I met my, my brother and sister from my father's first marriage. Um, they loved the story, but they couldn't use it because theirs was all about the search. But I did get the, the email of the, the producers of that show. Um, so they're, they're quite genuine. They were, they were willing to listen. Read and uh, don't be shy about reaching out. Like, oh, they don't want my story. They, they probably do. Um, Omnitrace, people search experts. These are these are folks who so they don't care who they are. They'll find them for you. It's not just for adoption. DNA detectives to the stars. They're bragging that they do the stars, but they do anyway. So. Now, we talk a lot about adoption, DNA. Is it the latest fad? Is it an industry that can make money? Or is it real? It's real. Autosomal is useful in matching a man or a woman to other men or women that they're related to. Matching occurs within a finite list of people who have taken the same test. For instance, on ancestry. You probably all know this, but I gotta get through it. Autosomal DNA is done by a couple of different firms. It's accurate to, Jeanette help me out here, I say to the, to the fourth generation. A lot of people say fifth or sixth. But yeah, that's find, what they say. I find yeah. false leads beyond four. Mm -hmm. um, and I gotta show you something. <laughs> let me finish the thought. Half relationships, half siblings, or folks who intentionally or inadvertently marry their second or first cousin will pee in the pool. Maybe they will mess up your, your numbers. It's a great analogy. <laughs> <laughs> they pee in the gene pool is what I call it. Sorry. You can slap me later. Um, 
the, the numbers just get skewed. The, it looks like a, like a first cousin, but it's really a brother. And so you, I, I, have a, I have another client right now, and she's, uh, she's Puerto Rican. And she says, you don't know anything about Puerto Rican research. And I says, I'm trying to. <laughs> she says, well, if you knew the history of Puerto Rico, it was very common to marry first and second cousins. I said, I know, that's why DNA doesn't really help you very much. She hired me on the spot. So. Um, you should work with somebody who's been there before and to interpret your results. You may think that the matches you've got are weak or they're, they're confusing. Um, get, get an expert to look at them. It's, it's even worth paying somebody, but usually uh, there's, there's a few people in town that I can see. Um, mitochondrial DNA is, is useful for female ancestors. I'm not as familiar with it, but it tends to be more generic. It tends to talk about ancient ancestors, you know, that your family came from France. Uh, it's, uh, it's not as useful for matching or finding relatives. Uh, Y-DNA, we talked about that. You said you did your Y-DNA. Y-DNA says for men, only men have Y-DNA. That one male has the same, or doesn't have the same, but I'll say, Y DNA says the one male has the same male ancestor on the, on the direct paternal line within X number of generations. So, um, two years ago I went through this. We, as a gentleman, he and I had tried to figure out for 10 years how we were related through autosomal DNA, and it just wasn't working. Couldn't make the connection. When we did the Y DNA, we discovered that we were 97, 98, 99 percent probability related within four or five and six generations. And then we did three other gentlemen who seemed to be in the same family. We laid them all next to each other. If you look at the probabilities and the distance for, for the relationship, Factor in the precision, you can actually determine whether it's a great grandfather, great great grandfather. It's usually four or five generations back. Um, and surprisingly, you know, they weren't all braids. Like I expected, you know, every wide match for me was going to be a braid somewhere back in time, right? And it's like, uh oh, you know, did mom lie to me? You know? uh, and it just turned out that the surname was not. Ten generations ago, the surname was not from the paternal side of my family. And so this Y DNA was from a different surname. So fascinating stuff. Get somebody to help you. But the, the, the Y matching is very, very expensive. You may end up with none. I had a client do it, it's like 400 bucks at the time. I had like 100 matches, and some of them are different levels of precision. Those came back not a single one, zero, nothing. What did you tell me to do that for? You know, it's like, can, can you imagine going on Ancestry DNA and there's no matches? So, uh, it's expensive. It's worth it if you're looking. Turn over every rock, right? All right. And like I said, keep in mind that you may have a brother or a parent out there or a cousin. If they haven't had a DNA test, you're not going to match them. Uh, but every Christmas when they're they're on sale for 59 bucks. Those people you're looking for might get curious. And, mm -hmm. and you may wake up one morning like I did and have a brother in your immediate family list. So don't give up. Okay, DNA links. <laughs> There's so much information here. Um, utilizing DNA tests to break through adoption roadblocks. <coughs> Beginner's Guide to Genealogy with Genetics. DNA testing for adoptees. Each of these is an entire exposition on, on the process, the results, and how to interpret what you find. And again, every one of these is interactive, so you need the digital version so you can come and click on these links or copy and paste them into your browser. And up will pop. Who's this from? The International Society of Genetic Genealogy. Fascinating stuff. Lots of links in here. I invite you to curl up on a rainy day and start hitting these. 
So, I always challenge, I've tried all the things I'm listening to my clients. Traditional genealogy, social media, adoption support groups, state records, state adoption assistance programs, what if they exist, adoption registries, professional adoption firms, and they'll, they'll find your parents. Uh, and DNA matching. And these are all ways in which I have had success. Does anybody have anything else that you might want to share with the group? Other than going to Aunt Sally and twisting her arm. <laughs> you know more than you're saying. <laughs> Ma, don't you have any other paper? It's, um, it's usually the exact opposite. You find out more than they ever know. All right. Here's some additional learning. What we got here? Uh, the Wikipedia in, in the FamilySearch.org. Just type in a question, and there's something written about it. It's fascinating how how much content there is. Seven resources to get you started. So it's a beginner. Another link for Blaine Bettinger. These are is an archive of all of his presentations. Can you imagine how many presentations Blaine Bettinger's done in the last 20 years? everywhere he speaks all the time. There's a topic there that, that you're going to learn from. Um, beginner's Guide, all about adoption research. America's orphan trains, if you're interested, if you think that your Midwest ancestor may have originated from New York City on the orphan train, there's a ton of information in that link. Road America's Orphan Trains, where your ancestors are moving. So, okay, I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. I'm sorry, you had a, you had something to add, and I. Forgot. I was just going to say I think I have a sixth cousin found on with autosomal on ancestry. Looks good. Sixth cousin, can you can you? Can you spot the line? Do you know the surname involved? Yeah. They it was the two links to it. It popped out, you know, and he's got almost everything that I have. I mean, you know. And the segments and the... the I haven't gotten into that far because it's, it's just an ancestry. If you stop in, I'll show you how to interpret the, the segments of Santa Morgan's to confirm yeah. what you're... So how do I get the Santa Morgan? It's just that ancestry. It's in there, but they've ancestry. recently changed ancestry DNAs. I haven't display. been brave enough to go into the data. <laughs> yeah, it, the information's been there since the start when they were doing autosomal DNA, but they've moved it. Now the, you have to go deeper to find the Santa Morgan's and the segments. I think they've, they've dumbed it down a little bit. Well, I, know, I know how many center organs there are, but I don't know where, if I can't compare if those center organs out of mine are the same as the ones that. What it'll tell you is between those two numbers, it'll tell you whether it's six cousin or one of them. And you can interpret that from both sides. I can help you through that. Yeah, I'll get in there. All right, you may not succeed, but I think everybody's heard this, that you don't regret the things on your deathbed that you did, you regret the things you didn't do. Go for the search, search it out. And I've heard this from more than one adoptee after they found their parents, they said, you know, that adoptees are very sensitive to their adopted parents. You know, they don't want to hurt their feelings or make them feel inadequate as parents. And I love this. It says, if a mother and father can love more than one child, why is it so hard to understand that a child can love more than one child? It's a nice thought. It's a way to explain what you're doing to your adopted parents so that you, you, you save their feelings. All right. A lot of stuff here. There's way too much to dive into details, but I've given you links the hundreds of things that you can spend a lifetime reading. Focus in, right? And focus in on the first list, and it'll tell you what to read in the second list, all right? Your considerations will guide your path. 
Um, when you get lost, give me a call. Come over to the Family History Library. There's 40 librarians there that for free will give you the best advice there is. All right. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. We have some refreshments, cookies, oh. juice, oh, please.